and welcome to Speech Communication 4397, Effective Meeting Management. This is class number 11. Today we're going to be focusing on public speaking and the requirements that exist in those situations where you as meeting managers are called on to make some kind of presentation to an audience. If you've had a basic public speaking class uh, prior to this, we're going to kind of cram all that theory into one class lecture, uh, hopefully to jog your memories on what to do. Uh, if you're new to the public speaking process, then this is a thumbnail sketch, and it won't serve you as well as going through a full, a full course and delivering four or five speeches in the course of a semester. Uh, but there are those times that you'll be called upon to make some kind of a presentation. If you reflect on the speakers that we've had this semester in here, our guest speakers were making presentations about their facilities, about their products, uh, about the city of Houston, about the things that they represent. Now, by and large, would you say, and this class is going to have to talk in here today, you home people think about it, would you say that the speakers we've had so far, what would you say the purpose of their presentation was? Okay, Mike sell their product or to sell their service. Uh, they get the exposure by coming here, and this is broadcast 33 counties, so they obviously dress well, they're well-groomed, well-informed, and they try their okay. dead level best to make a good presentation. Okay, so but their purpose is to sell, themselves. to sell themselves and especially their product. Were they doing anything else? Purpose-wise, focus on purpose for a minute. Okay, well, let's flip over to a visual here if we can get this up on the screen. Uh, generally, purposes in public, in public speaking are classified as informative, persuasive, entertaining, or ceremonial, or some combination of those. So even though I invited our guests under the umbrella of information, and primarily that was what I was interested in, and having them impart to you. Uh, and they did a very fine job of doing that. You got information about convention centers and services, information about hotels, uh, information about how contracts are negotiated. There was at the same time the blended effect that they were selling their products and the examples that they chose uh, focused on what they had to offer and therefore there was a persuasive element to those presentations as well. If we view the informative, persuasive, uh, if, we, if we view those purposes as a kind of continuum, then we can see that down at one end of the continuum is a purpose that's basically informative. The goal is to share information, to impart knowledge to the audience, uh, I hope that's what's happening in the lectures, that unless, yeah, there may be a, a peripheral persuasion in here that being a meeting manager someday could be a fun, profitable job. But on the whole, uh, hopefully in any university class, the primary objective, the overall purpose in that presentation is to share information with the audience. But down at the other end of the continuum are those situations where it's your job to persuade. Persuasion may mean any of a variety of things. It may mean uh, reinforcing the ideas of the audience. You know, there's some things that are hard to argue with. You ought to go vote. You know, you're pretty un-American if you took the opposite side of that one, maybe un-citizen. Uh, that's not just an American thing. Uh, Keep America beautiful. You know, who's going to go out and make a speech that says, I encourage each one of you today to trash at least one city block? You know, be sure you throw all your garbage out of your car. No. You know, so there are some things that the audience believes, but they just need to be reminded. They, they need those ideas reinforced. You know, and maybe if you're selling a city or a particular property or a meeting site, whatever the case may be, Oh, the audience is kind of predisposed that way anyhow, and so they just need a reinforcement of that. But other times you need to change people's ideas. You know, I remember the first time that I visited a horizontal property, 
and it had never occurred to me that you really could pull off a successful convention in a horizontal property because I had, even though I'd been to lots of conventions, they'd all been in vertical properties, primarily downtown hotels. So that was a novel experience that was helpful to be on site for a FAM tour as we talked about last time. Uh, but that was a persuasive presentation to show you how even though your guests are scatter scattered, even though there may be inclement weather or whatever, uh, that that could be a workable site and so forth. But the point is the purpose in that speech was to change the minds of the audience. Okay, to change your way of thinking, to change your attitude. Okay, now further down that persuasive continuum is what we sometimes call a speech to actuate, where you want the person to sign the contract right there on the spot. You want the person to do whatever it is you're advocating, whether it's donate blood or give money to the cause or sign up for whatever it is. And it's important to recognize on the front end, as your book says, why are you giving this presentation? And if you don't know what that big, broad objective is on the front end, you're going to have difficulties ever putting the presentation together. Doesn't matter how confident you are or how much information you have, if you don't know why you're going into the speaking situation in the first place, you know, uh, then you're going to be confused. Now the other uh, purposes we may be less likely to deal with in here, speeches to entertain you usually think of as after dinner speeches, uh, stand up sitcom comedy, not sitcom, uh, stand up comedy routines, things like that. To the extent that you can incorporate some humor into your presentation, that's good. You know, people enjoy a chuckle about the best I ever do is get a little smile here and there out of an audience. You know, telling jokes is not my strong suit. And see, I got a little chuckle there. That's good. You probably couldn't hear that at home, but if you all sm Yeah, there, Michael laughed in the microphone for you. Okay. Uh, some people tell jokes very effectively. You know, if you do that, it needs to fit the topic. It needs to fit the situation. You don't just pause and say, well, I think I'll tell you this really incredible joke and we all have a chuckle and then we get back on uh, track. But there are speeches, the sole purpose of which is to entertain. But you need to be really good, you need to be competent at that if you take on that assignment. Then there are other, uh, there's another category that I've just kind of grouped together as ceremonial and you may well find yourself doing that someday from giving toast to paying tribute, uh, speeches of welcome if you end up in a a convention bureau or the mayor's office or something, you know, it may fall your lot to go to some of these conventions and welcome people uh, to the city. Uh, you may be welcome, if you're with a, a property or special agency, you may be welcoming them uh, to that. There are all kinds of speeches of welcome that occur. There are speeches of tribute, uh, there are speeches of thanks. You know, there are all those little ceremonial kinds of things you do. At the retirement party, somebody has to get up and give the present and say thank you and all. So uh, those speeches, though, even in the ceremonial category, are basically either informative or persuasive. You're either informing people about who this guest speaker is or you're convincing the audience that this was a wonderful person and I want you to join me in wishing them well as we give them their airplane tickets to Australia, you know, whatever the case may be, or their watch, whatever it is that they're getting. But it's important that you know what the purpose of your presentation is on the front end. Okay, then you're going to have a topic. Now sometimes people call you up and say, will you come over and talk about parliamentary procedure? Will you come over and talk about parent, these kinds of things they say to me, you know, will you talk about parent-child communication or crisis communication or whatever. Normally, there's some kind of guideline from the person who is, is booking the presentation with you. When I phoned our guest, I didn't just say, would you come over and talk to a college class for an hour? Pick your own topic. You know, we, we work through what their areas of expertise are and how that fit into the objectives of the course and so on. Probably a public speaking class is one of the few places where they say, make a speech, go pick a topic. 
Okay, but most of the time it's going to come out of your area of expertise. It'll be job related or, or personally related to your experiences in some way. But the topic has to be of interest to the audience. Hopefully it's of interest to you because we're going to see later on that that's crucial to making the whole presentation interesting. It's hard to get command of material and learn information that you're totally bored with. You know, you're like, oh, well, yeah, let me tell you about this, you know, and I'm so bored with my own speech that I can't get through it. And we've got a problem there. And if the audience goes to sleep, there's a problem. Okay, and it needs to be relevant to the situation, relevant to the occasion. You know, if, if I'm invited to talk about parent-child communication, then that's what I need to talk about, not the leading communication theories in the field today, or not the essentials of basic public speaking, and so forth. Well, when you put the general purpose with the topic, then you come up with a specific purpose. You know, beyond my goal is to inform you about, is to inform you, it becomes my goal is to inform you about the, the fundamentals or the basics of public speaking. My goal is to share with you how my particular property can meet the needs of your group, whatever. So then that purpose converts to some sort of thematic statement. You know, if you had to boil your speech down to one key phrase, Houston's should be your next convention site. The campus hotel has a conference facility that can meet your needs. Or uh, it's time for our organization to take a boat cruise. Or, or, or. We need to, whatever the key statement is, but, but you need to get a focus on that early on. Okay, assuming you have that then, you're ready to think about your introduction, your body, your conclusion, of the, the actual preparation of the speech. Now what do you think, which part do you think you do first? Where do you start? You know, usually with, with term papers, I remember starting at the beginning, you know, and just kind of working my way through. Is that, is that what you do with a speech? Mm -hmm. Probably start at the, start the end and uh, decide where you want to go or how you want to get to the end. Okay. Uh, you, would, you certainly wouldn't start with the introduction. It's hard to introduce something that doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, you may know where you want to end up, in which case you can work on the conclusion first. Put your hand up, Michael. Yeah. In looking at the uh, visual aid you have, if you're going to give a speech and you're going to gain attention, you want it to be something that has an immediate impact, You've previewed your speech, and to establish your credibility, you most certainly are going to give your credentials. Okay, what, let's hang on this. For, oh, go ahead and ask. We're going to come back. I'm going to do only the first three, and then, and then I thought the three were going to stop us. If you're going to establish credibility, you have a good speaking mannerism, but you have to have credentials. You can't be Joe Blow, who read this in a magazine, and now comes in here to inform me. If you want me to respect what you're going to say, establish your credentials within the first no more than five minutes after you begin. You have my attention for the first minute before I begin to lose it. If you haven't previewed your speech effectively, now you've lost me. After that, your credentials are worthless to me. Okay. Hopefully, you have my credentials before I ever show up. Or the gentlemen, the three people that came here the other day, or the, the, your guest, of all of them, and I'm not exerting a bias here, but I enjoyed Mr. Webster more than all the rest of them, and I knew nothing about him except what you put in the syllabus but he managed to establish his credentials with me mm -hmm. within three to five minutes after he began speaking. Right, and he, but he had... But he did lead in, he led into it enough to get my attention, right. and keep he, it, and then continue with his credentials. Okay, and he had a longer history of credentials that could be established. Oh. What did I ask you? <laughs> oh, where, that's all right, thank you. <clears throat> oh. Sometimes if you don't have the material completely together to start with, then you would, you would begin your preparation with the body of the speech, focusing on what am I going to talk about here, how do I want to approach this, uh, what key points do I want to make, and you'd have to gather that material. Sometimes you have to go do additional research, Other time, depending on your level of expertise, uh, sometimes you can pull that out of your own uh, background experiences, knowledge, and so forth. 
So don't be surprised if you find yourself starting with the middle of the speech, and we'll look at some organizational patterns in a minute, but you find yourself starting with the core of the speech and looking at how much time you have available, because that's a big factor. If you have five minutes, you know, maybe two good points and that's it. You have two hours, you have a lot more time to develop what you're doing and cover more material. So you may build the body of the speech first and then when you've got that and your key points and so forth, say, all right, how can I pull those together into a conclusion? I'll need to summarize those key points. I'll need to create some kind of focal point with them. And we're going to come back to credibility in just a moment. Okay, but you've got the body, you've got it, the conclusion together. Then you're ready to go back to the introduction. Then you're ready to think about how you can gain attention. Uh, one of the last things I'm going to do today is share with you how one gentleman approached four different audiences in very different ways based on what he perceived the cognitive styles of those audiences to be. Uh, but, you know, think about with your particular group, sometimes you have a real dog and pony show that you can run, you have flamboyant visual aids, fantastic graphics, fireworks, you know, it may be an awesome thing. Other times it's just a rather straightforward presentation, kind of like class today. You know, you've got a, maybe a colorful visual aid, whether it's a transparency, a poster, a flip chart, um, some sort of overhead, and you're working with that. Uh, what kinds of things gain attention? What causes people to pay attention? Let's name some factors. Color. Yeah. Okay, color. I wore red today because I knew you all had to look at me the whole time. That's good. Cougar red. Yeah, what else? Movement. Okay, it helps as a speaker. We don't want you flailing around all over the place. And if you're on a camera, it helps if you stay relatively still. If this were the classroom, and we had more space than I'd be walking around moving from one segment to another. But when that same picture is getting translated to the screen, you know, you don't see the people uh, doing the weather or the evening news or, or whatever. You shouldn't see them dashing around all over the screen, you know, unless they've scripted this with their cameraman first and, they know, and he or she knows which way they're going to go. Are you liable to see them going off the picture? Okay. But hand gestures, facial expression, those kinds of movements are good rather than just standing there very still and very quiet and saying, I have something very important to talk to you about today. Yeah. And we'll talk about delivery uh, more too. But if, if your style is saying, oh yeah, this is really exciting, you know, why should your audience get fired up about that? Okay, so you're, you need to preview the material, you need to gain attention, color, Movement, anything else? Okay. Voice, voice inflection. Okay, we'll talk about voice more too, but what you do with your voice helps create variety. <coughs> Excuse me. And variety is one of the things we like. Okay, those of you that are video game addicts, you know, you like the, the video games with lots of variety, lots of suspense, lots of action which is similar to movement, uh, but they're slightly unpredictable. They're predictable enough that you can play with some degree of success, but they're uh, unpredictable enough to hold your interest. So presentations are the same way. If, if we're going into a keynote address at a convention or uh, major sales presentations, there has to be some combination of those factors in order to hold your interest. Okay, Michael talked about credibility. Your credibility needs to be established on the front end. How are you going to do that? <coughs> okay, if it's not done for you in the introduction, then it's something that you need to do for yourself. Uh, sometimes people ask for resumes and, and get detailed information. Uh, you don't want the introduction of a speaker to be longer than the speaker's actual presentation. And there have been a few instances where I've seen that where, you know, it's a career achievement award and the person turned in a 20-page biography or resume 
and autobiography, I guess, and resume, and the speaker doing the introducing ended up reading half of that to the audience. And then the, the keynote speaker is, you know, shortened by time if there's a scheduled hour of, of dismissal and so forth. But whatever you can do in your remarks to establish your credibility. And, you know, Mr. Webster did that directly in his presentation. It was more indirect with the other speakers and not as lengthy. But as they said things to you like knowing what my competitor is doing, knowing who my competitors are, knowing what they have to offer, yeah, statements like that let you know that they've been out there in the field doing this stuff, uh, outbidding one another and, and making comparative analyses and so forth. But the factors that go into credibility are experience, trustworthiness, and they've done a little questionnaires and surveys to help establish these things. Dynamism, and you can say, well, it shouldn't be like that, whether you're dynamic or not, uh, shouldn't count. Well, maybe it shouldn't, but we tend to believe, and what we're looking at here is who is credible, who will we believe? We believe the dynamic speakers more so than the wimpy, wussy, boring ones. They need to have command of their material. Now, I'm, I'm flying with a key outline here today because I'm supposed to know this stuff. Okay? But if I were having to stand up here and say, okay, the three purposes of an introduction are number one, <coughs> number two, you know, you know, what's her problem? How long has she been teaching this stuff? You know, they're paying her to do this and she has to read it. Now, they're, quickie. Yeah, what are your <laughs> I noticed you used flashcards and... No, note cards. Note cards, flash, we used to call them flashcards in school. And I seriously wondered how well that person was prepared if they didn't have those flashcards. Because every time you pose a question, if you're in the area of the flashcard, it's like a lawyer who cross-examines a witness based on an outline. If he gets the wrong answer, he's done for the rest of the day. You've got to be able to think on your feet. Right. Well, you know, we cut people some slack in here. The television camera does interesting things that people, you know, I should bring some of you up here and let you see how it feels to look out the other direction. Uh, but I'm sure that that's, yeah, I have somebody in the class making ugly faces right now who will go unnamed. Uh, you know, but th so our, our guests in some sense were over-prepared in some cases notes-wise those who'd never been on camera before because they wanted to be sure that they didn't run out of stuff and that they knew where they were to, on their timeline. And that's good. You know, if, if you don't know how long it takes you to go through material or you haven't done your spiel so many times that you know you can cut 10 or 15 minutes off at the end or stretch it out for another five or 10, you know, only once in here in a different class did I run short by three or four minutes. But I was having to go back and recap and summarize over again. And you know, the people who knew me knew I was stretching it at the finish line. But that's okay. We filled up the tape, you know, we did what we were supposed to do. But in those few minutes it became very uncomfortable. And if you're in a situation that's new to you, you're not sure how long it takes you to make a point and so forth, better to bring those notes and bring those materials uh, than to end up totally losing your train of thought. Let me go to Nicole and then we'll come back up. From the Bureau, mm -hmm, uh, Mr. Mr. Webster. Webster, he had notes also though. And I think basically it's just to get, make sure you're on track, give you an outline of what you're talking about. When you have to speak in front of someone for a er, class for an hour and a half, is that wrong to have no notes or an outline? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, but you need to be flexible with those. And I think that's what Michael's saying, that if a question is raised, you can get to that and get back to where you are. But those notes may even help you in getting back on track. And you know, that's why I've, got an, why I've got an outline so the home viewers can tell where we are in this too. But this is also for my benefit. So you know, if we 30 minutes from now we're still not off of this page, I'll know I need to, well we will be. I promise we will be. You know, this, this one's the biggie. Uh -huh. In case I was misconstrued, I didn't mean that as a criticism. I just said if you're not well prepared to deal with an active audience, 
such as this is not just a speech receiving class. This is a class that is encouraged to ask questions. If you come back and do an end around and this person is stuck on that area of his notes, you may throw him completely off. The proper way to, is always be prepared for that. If you're just giving a speech where people are going to listen and do nothing else but either applaud you when you're done, no or throw tomatoes. Oh, one or the yeah. other. But if you're going to have an interactive class where people may pop a question at you that was, which, which was something you referred to 10, 15 minutes ago, well, God, be ready for that. Because if not, you're going to look kind of not very smart having to fumble back through notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we got trickle. Do we pass you by or you got to? Uh, she, she. Same thing. Okay. Good. Great minds. <laughs> All right. So it's important then that you do these things. You want your credibility established early on. That means you need to know your material from the word go. If you have to read your opening statements, I mean, unless you're reading a really profound quotation that's just too difficult to memorize, you know, but uh, having good command of the material from the beginning all the way through. And you want to look as good at the finish line as you do when you start. Now, in, in beginning classes, we sometimes encounter situations where people started their speeches two or three weeks out and finished them at 2 a.m. before they were due at 10 a.m. And so the first part of it, they know really well, you know, and they're just trucking along, and then they get to this point where, oh, yeah, you know, what were the subpoints here? Um, 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 uh, 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 and it's time to get into the notes and get your head down. Okay. Sometimes it works the other way. People are so nervous in the first part of the presentation that they look less credible than they actually are. Uh, but then as, t as time goes along, you know, this is a 10-minute speech, and I'm now six or seven minutes in, and hey, this is going okay, and it wasn't so bad as I thought it was. And in fact, I don't even mind too much. I'm having a pretty good time. And so then they loosen up and get more comfortable with the audience, and, and there's that feeling of, yeah, I can do this. And so their credibility gets better, and they finish better than they started. And so what you're looking for is a, is a good balance there that causes you to look good all the way through. Be sure to know how you're going to finish. Occasionally, we have folks that forget to have a conclusion. They may summarize their key points, and it's kind of like, uh, so I guess that's all. And, it, and it's just kind of left, you know, the, 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 that's all, folks, sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah, right. So it's important that you state your case and you prove it. And we're going to come to that shortly. Uh, if, you're, if you wish to make notes in your textbook, about page 255 is where the section on public speaking uh, begins. <clears throat> There's some questions about uh, to whom are you speaking audience analysis. We'll come back to that in a little while. You have to know the basic things about where your speech will be given and, and uh, so forth. On 257, there are some patterns of organization. And for our purposes on the visual, I just said, you know, in order to state your case, <clears throat> you have to organize it according to some kind of a plan. And if it's an informative speech, then you may be uh, using a chronological outline, tracing the history of events. Sometimes it's a spatial outline. Uh, if you were touring a hotel property, that's a spatial sort of thing. Uh, sometimes it's simply a topical outline. What you have from me today is a topical outline. You know, it isn't chronological. It, it, it's a tiny bit spatial in the sense that we talk about, oh, I guess a tiny bit chronological, in talking about the segments and sequence of the speech parts. But by and large, this is a topical outline. There are certain subjects that we need to carry, carry, cover, rented lips, that we need to cover and I put those in what seem like a reasonable order to me, and so that's what we're doing. But sometimes you classify things, sometimes you compare things. Uh, if it's a persuasive speech, then your pattern of organization may be problem-solution. Here's the problem, there's a need to do something, uh, here is the solution that I'm proposing, here is how the solution will solve the problem. <clears throat> it's always good to make that link for the audience, you know, the debaters would call it a plan meets need argument. But the, the solution that I'm proposing will solve the problem that exists. 
and then it sometimes is useful to point out the advantages that will result from that. If we adopt this property or go to this site or pick this menu or choose this time schedule, you know, whatever it is we're talking about, go with this particular agency, uh, the advantages to this are as follows. At the same time, you have to be aware of the disadvantages. Are there things that could go wrong if we're planning this great outdoor bash? You know, what are the disadvantages to that? Uh, you know, will this work? Can you get into trouble weather-wise, temperature -wise? That's part of the t weather. But you know, can, will, if it rains, will that impact your event? Uh, if it's too hot and humid, will it impact your event? If a hurricane comes ashore and it does all of the above, you know. What kinds of things can go wrong with the solution that you're headed toward? And so you do a comparison of those advantages and disadvantages to see on balance how does this weigh out. But you may find yourself in that kind of a format uh, if this is a persuasive presentation. Sometimes you're just doing a comparison of how things are with how they could be. And some books will label that a comparative advantages position. You know, there's nothing particularly wrong right now with what's going on, but if we adopted what you're advocating, we could be better off. You know, maybe your meeting has been in a most pleasant location. Uh, everything's gone fine. Your guests have been happy, et cetera. Um, but a presentation is made to you that says it could be better for the same price. You know, if you, if you move a weekend one way or the other, you talked about some of those things with the reps. You know, but by changing the date, you might get these additional benefits. By changing the location, you might get these additional benefits. It's kind of like deciding whether or not you should buy a new car. You know, there are some of us that need a new car. The one we're driving is at death's door. You know, th there is a problem. It could fall apart at any given moment anywhere on a freeway, and that's not good. That's problematic. And so, you know, what's the solution in terms of cost, et cetera, et cetera. But then there are others who don't really need a new car. They would just kind of want a new car. And if you had a new car, then there would be these advantages that occur. I mean, you know, you'd have newer tires, you'd have clean upholstery, you'd have a better stereo, you might get more push button uh, gadgets, uh, you know, whatever, depending on the brand and, and so forth that you're dealing with. And we won't advertise for anyone here, you know. But the new car would have certain advantages over what you're driving. Of course, it also brings a price tag with it. Um, unless you have a benefactor over there on the side, you know, who's going to take care of you. Um, but the comparative advantages approach would say, I recognize things are not bad now. You've got a good deal right now. Your group is happy. You know, your meetings have been running nicely. But things can be better if. And, and that's a persuasive attitude that you may take in presenting uh, your case, whatever that may be. That means that there's going to be some reasoning in this, particularly if it's a persuasive speech. You're going to be giving reasons why something should be done. Part of stating your case involves giving the reasons why. Uh, sometimes you work inductively. You, know, you give examples of different things, and then you pull those examples together and make a generalization. Other times, you start with the generalization and then pull out specific applications from that. So it can work either way. Sometimes you use a cause-effect kind of format. Uh, there are causes to the problem, causes to the situation, and that produces certain effects. Or maybe you start with the effects and say, let's look at the situation. Here it is. And then you say, ah, but what caused this? And then you go back and you pull the causes out and identify the causes. You may need to eliminate the causes or work around. It depends on what you're doing. Okay, but those are, are different kinds of formats. Uh, those are briefly uh, touched upon in your textbook, too, if you need to go uh, back through and sort those out. But it's your job to prove your case. 
And if it's persuasive, you have a bigger job of proof than you do if it's informative. If it's an informative presentation, basically you're just proving it by giving good information. You know, you're, you're proving to us that your information is valid, that your facts are real, uh, that your evidence is good. Okay, in terms of supporting materials, you have a variety of things that you can do. You, examples are very popular, are very useful. Most people enjoy examples. That's better than just giving definitions and descriptions and uh, dealing with things in a, a less concrete kind of way. The examples can help give a, a concrete, tangible element to what you're talking about. Okay? Uh, you may also use illustrations, which are longer presentations. You may use statistics. And if you get into very many statistics, then you're going to need to get into some kind of visual aids. Uh, in your text, about page 266, 267, you have some examples of all kinds of little charts, bar charts, pie charts, segmented bar graphs, um, <clears throat> a three-dimensional chart. You have a number of things available to you. But numbers are very difficult for an audience to remember. You might be able to remember that the crime rate is up or down 3% compared to last year. But if you start rattling off the statistics for the number of homicides, the number of traffic accidents, the number of felonies, the number of Class C misdemeanors, you know, pretty soon all those numbers are just going to run together in the head of your audience. And they'll go, okay, I think on the whole this means crime went up. Or things are better this year than they were last year. But the, the audience is going to do that leveling for you, or for themselves. They probably don't care about you. Yeah, but, but they'll have to level that out in some way. And so if you want them to really grasp those statistics, grasp the numbers in your examples, then they need some kind of visual. Even if you just write the number down and put that on the chart, or whatever, you know, 327. That's the number I want you to remember uh, today. But if it's converted to some sort of graphics, then that's even better. Oh. Sometimes you can bring objects, you know, real visuals that are helpful, uh, like the day you got to sample the pastries and so forth. You know, that was a good visual aid, at least those that I saw sampling seemed to enjoy it. Uh, but that was a tangible thing, and that's better than just looking at photographs. And looking at photographs is better than just talking about something. So these are the kinds of things that you'll use and do uh, to build the body of your speech. Okay, any question about what we've got on this visual about the basic speech preparation? I think from what I know of, of most of you, most of you have given a speech somewhere before, so uh, you know, hopefully this will just kind of jog your mind uh, in terms of that. But we're, not integrating your performances in here, but we want you to be aware of those uh, kinds of things. Okay, let's talk a little bit about delivery. Some of this we've touched on uh, indirectly in conjunction with our discussion of credibility. But there are four main areas to keep in mind. One is your body language, our kinesics, you know, your gestures, your facial expression, your posture. Uh, all of that works together to say this is a competent, confident speaker or this is a droopy, wimpy, wrung out kind of speaker. And, and your body language will say, you know, energy, enthusiasm, interest in the audience, or it'll say, I'm bored with myself, you know, I can hardly wait to get through making this presentation so we can all go home and your audience will, will read and sense that from your uh, body language. Your visual directness is important. When you're in a small audience where people can see you and you can see them, you need to look them straight in the eyes. You know, you can tell when I'm not looking at you. The home viewers can tell when I'm looking at them. Okay, and you can all tell if I'm staring at the wall or off to the side or if I'm you know, looking up over my head while I'm thinking or if I'm inspecting my fingers because I'd really rather not look at the audience, 
you know, we know that. Now, the bigger the audience gets, of course, the more impersonal it becomes, which kind of relates to the next one. There, proxemics refers to the space uh, between the sender and the receiver. Uh, there are lots of studies done in interpersonal communication about uh, messages that are sent in that social distance. Generally, we think of public distance as beyond 12 feet. Uh, social distance is roughly 4 to 12 feet. Personal distance, about arm's length, but of course that depends on how long your arm is, and most people have longer arms than I do, but uh, arm's length, roughly 18 inches to about 3 or 3 and a half feet. Intimate, less than elbow, you know, 0 to 18 inches. You're not going to give hugs or be affectionate or do much uh, shoulder patting or anything else if you're beyond 18 inches. You know, oh, good job, but just don't let me get too close to you. You know, we usually don't function that way. Well, in public speaking, we don't have to worry about that touch element so much as we may choose to if, if we're communicating interpersonally. But the tone of voice, and this will connect some with, with the last segment down here, but, but your voice and your facial expression will remain very much the same, whether you're talking to one person who's standing beside you, whether you're talking to two or three people who are nearby. As the size of the group increases, your volume is going to, it should, increase, the span of your gestures should increase, okay? But the, the intonation in your voice is going to remain very much the same. And we'll come back to that as we pursue that a little more. Artifacts refers to objects that communicate. And meaning is in the mind of the receiver. So uh, whether or not the logo on your shirt is significant to someone else. Oh, uh, you know, we have an ad for the Astros in here. I can't read yours. Is that a university? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you can stand up if you want to. You know, we've we got a U of H. You boy, guys can both stand up if you want to and face the camera. Stand up. stand up. Give us a wide shot of the room here. Yeah, can you see these shirts? Maybe. Maybe come out in the center. Yeah, aren't they, aren't they beautiful? Okay, thank you. Okay, great job. Great job. My visual aid, my impromptu visual aids for the day. Okay. Now, whether or not you thought that was cool or not probably depends on whether uh, you're one of our U of H students watching this. If you're a channel surfer from A&M, you probably went, yeah, or probably flipped the channel on by and uh, kept going. Or UT, pick on anybody else around that you want to. Okay. Oh. But meaning is in the mind of the receiver. And whether or not something communicates or not is not always up to the speaker. You know, if, if you think the person looks professionally dressed, looks sharp, uh, that's your interpretation. If you think they look really geeky or stupid, that's your interpretation. You know, there are things that uh, go down the sidewalk sometime that, you know, I, I can't. Um, and I mean, I have friends who wear some of this apparel. You know, but I, but I look at some of these things and I think, I wonder why they made that choice. You know, because it's, it's not the but it's not my business, you know, it's their choice. But as speakers, we're interested in doing whatever we can based on the audience that we have to communicate competency. And that may mean dressing in expensive suits, you know, going the whole nine yards to look your professional best. Or it may mean coming very casually in tennis shoes to relate to an audience that is in a, a much more comfortable environment. You don't expect the tennis instructor to show up in a business suit out on the tennis court. You know, they come dressed for the audience that they have. They come dressed to communicate based on their expertise. And so the artifacts are an important part. And to the extent that you know your audience, you can make judgments about uh, whether you should or should not wear certain jewelry, certain clothes, certain colors, uh, whatever, based on what the occasion and activities for the day are. But we want to be aware that objects communicate. And you know that it's an important part of what you're doing as a meeting planner uh, to recognize how the ambience communicates. You know, we're focusing on the public speaker today, but you know that 
the ambiance of your expensive restaurants is very different from fast food, and we've touched on that in here a little before. Okay, the fourth important dimension of delivery involves your voice. It's sometimes, sometimes called vocalics. It's sometimes called paralanguage. But it's what you do with your voice in order to communicate. And say, I just delivered that sentence in a certain way. I could have said, it's what you do with your voice in order to communicate. Or, it's what you do with your voice in order to communicate. It's what you do with your voice when you communicate. You know, well, you know, the, the first run through was the one that I thought was the most appropriate for me and so forth. But what you're doing is, is using elements that include volume. The group has to be able to hear you. And if you don't have a microphone, you're in a different situation than if you do. It's not, it's, if you have a microphone, you, know, you don't want your mouth right on top of it. You don't want to pop the P's and the B's and the T's and make all those disgusting sounds that you know, cause the audience to cringe and so forth. Uh, clearing your throat and sniveling and doing other obnoxious things is you know, inappropriate and gross and ruins your credibility. Uh, the audience has to be able to hear you. No, and there are some times that the PA systems are not working well. They simply don't amplify enough, and you, have, you need to adjust and be aware of that. Get a technician in to help if need be. You know, it's better to check those things out ahead of time uh, so that you know what you're dealing with and, and things are ready to go before you ever start. But if you don't have a microphone, you have to adjust for the room. And if you're not sure plant someone in the back or simply ask, you know, if, uh, if you can hear this, hold up your left hand or, or whatever the case may be, some kind of cue to find out if the people all the way to the back of the room uh, are hearing you and understanding what you're saying. A lot of times the problem with volume, I have some people who tell me, I just can't talk any louder. This is the biggest voice that I have. You know, I can't sing any louder, I can't talk any louder, this, this is my voice. Well, most of you can scream and yell. If the building were on fire, you could probably pump it out, okay? I can't imagine anybody going down the hall going, fire, fire, we're having a fire, you know. Now, often what's happened, I think, and especially with the generation of joggers, we have a lot of people who've learned to breathe from up here. It's called clavicular breathing, the, you know, the fast panting, get that air in in a hurry. And when that happens, when you have that shallow breathing, then it's much more difficult to sustain a whole sentence from start to finish. It's more difficult to get the volume you need to punch it out so it can be heard in the back of the room. You know, and I'll spare the microphone here, but if I needed to be, I could probably be heard at a couple of hundred feet away, clearly. I'm not sure how long the voice would last, you know, but, but what it involves is taking some deep breaths, feeling your rib cage expand, feeling your lungs really fill up with air, and keeping some of that air on reserve so that you never just run completely out. It's when you run out of breath that the words trail off, the endings drop, and we lose parts of what's being said. But having a good deep breath and keeping some air on reserve gives you that support that you need in order to keep going. So, you know, get by yourself somewhere so you don't feel like an idiot in front of your family and friends. And practice taking some deep breaths. See how far you can count on one breath or recite the alphabet or you know, whatever excites you. Uh, but practice on that and see if you can't work on that breath control. Don't let all the air out in the first two or three seconds or five or six seconds. See if, you, if, if you're stuck in freeway traffic, this is one of those little things you can do to entertain yourself and the people in the cars around you don't wonder what you're doing and all. But uh, sit there and watch your little clock in the car and, and time, how, how long you can go on one breath, how much volume you can get on one breath, so forth. Okay, the rate 
is how fast or how slowly you're speaking. Most of us need to pep it up. Okay? Uh, many speakers, and particularly beginning speakers, tend to go rather slowly. And if you have someone who kind of trails it off and takes a while to get the ideas out, you know, what happens? Boring. Or your mind just wanders off, you know, well, they're going to be on this sentence for at least another 20 seconds. I've got time to work a math problem and come back or prepare my shopping list or whatever the case may be. The flip side of that is that you don't want to talk so fast that it all tends to run together and most people don't articulate very well when they talk this fast and so you just kind of get a blur of all the words and it runs together and it's like, oh gee, that's too much trouble to pay attention. I'm having to work too hard when it's going that fast. So some modulation in there. You got a question? Yeah. It's all time for Federal Express like the old advertiser uh -huh. did. Peter. Yeah. And for a while, you know, briefly, that may hold attention. I mean, hopefully for you, and, oh, gee, what's she doing there? Okay. But we don't want to listen to that very long because it, it creates a blur. The voice loses its expressiveness and so forth. So you're looking for a balance in there while at the same time you're keeping it moving. But that's what your rate is about. The pitch is how high or how low your voice is. Yeah. Uh, it w I would have a peculiar voice. If I were standing here talking to you like this, you probably wouldn't want to listen to it. And if I was talking to you down there very long, the voice wouldn't last too long. Uh, and, but you go, this, this voice doesn't match the person. Uh, this is not what my ear wants to listen to. Uh, you've all been out to Intercontinental Airport and heard the computer voice on the tram. The tram is now leaving the station. Please step away from the doors. Da 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 ba ba ba. You know, and you could just kind of lull yourself to sleep with that if you didn't really need. You know, if you know your way around, don't need to listen to it. Uh, it's a monotone. Maybe they've got two pitches. I think it's all on one. I haven't been out there for a while. But that's a monotone, and most of us don't want to listen to a monotone for very long. We want what's called vocal variety. And if we were to draw a graph of your voice, plot that, you know, then you could plot those pitches up and down. Most of us talk probably in about a one octave range, about eight notes. Say, what? Oh, no. Oh, no. Is that an octave where my musicians? Eh, probably six, okay. Well, let's see, M, B, C, that's six. One, six, four. Okay, a six note range for sure, sometimes eight notes if you're really getting excited. But if, if you have two or three notes that you're stuck on, and I can't even do that without really working, I can get into a monotone pretty easily. But to hold it to a two or three note range is uncomfortable because I've worked so hard to get rid of that. But if you tape record yourself and listen, and if you can play a guitar or a piano, anything that you can find a note on, you'll discover that you also have an optimal pitch. You ha and you have one note that you're on, hopefully you're on your optimum pitch. But you'll have one note that you're on more than the others. And that one right there is the one I tend to hit the most. Okay, it's probably an A or an F below middle C, I'm not sure, I haven't checked it lately. And it doesn't really matter. But you can use that as a kind of guide to see, see, I, I hit a higher pitch there. So if I wanted to check that and say, okay, am I up two notes, am I up five notes? If you're just messing around someday and want to do that. But the point is, you want variety in your voice and you want some range in those pitches. But you don't want so much range that it becomes silly or that it becomes inappropriate. You know, don't go out making speeches so that you were talking like this and going up and going down and back and forth because your teacher told you to have vocal variety when you were speaking. You know, that lost its expressiveness. It lost the relevance to meaning. Uh, but 
If you recognize that you're in a short range, sometimes you can le read your homework assignments out loud, you know, whether it's your history book, your literature book, your favorite home reading, whatever. Practice reading those aloud, concentrating on the expressiveness, concentrating on articulating. I didn't put that word up here, but articulation is how clearly you pronounce those words. And there's a, te and I'm from Texas, and whatever part of me is fixed, okay, is fixed, and whatever part regress, the twang comes through sometimes. But there's still a lot of folks in Texas that have what we call a rigid jaw. And that lower jaw just kind of gets stuck there. And their mouth doesn't move very much. Their lips don't move very much. Now what happened to, and we're coming up on quality here, what happens to my vocal quality when I don't open my mouth? Mumbles. Okay, could you understand me? Mumbles. Well, no, I just now had a rigid jaw. Can you understand what I'm saying? I've been here long enough to understand it, but if, it, if you're dealing it's, with a diverse audience, they're going to have a hard time understanding it. Okay, it's bit. harder to understand. Something else happens. Was that, I think it happened, <laughs> you tell me. Uh, was that as pleasant, to, was that more unpleasant to listen to? Try not to give you a loaded question here. Okay, becomes unpleasant because vocal quality refers to uh, that texture of the voice as the voice breathy. And breathy, you, you know, there's just too much air going through at a time. And it may be real sexy in some context, but it, it won't, not now. <laughs> yeah, you, know, it, you can't sustain a very long sentence unless you're really good at that. But then there are other qualities of the voice that we may call strident or harsh or raspy. And when I was talking with my rigid jaw, once that air, you know, came, we, we talked about breathing in deeply and, you know, so forth. The air's going to come up through your lungs, across your bronchial tubes. Everybody had biology, you know. Uh, up your trachea, then come up your throat. It comes up your windpipe, two separate functions there. Across your vocal mechanism, through the vocal me mechanism, across your larynx, which has your vocal cords. And just like the strings on the violin or whatever stringed instrument you want to use, that's where the sound gets created. But at this point, it's a very little sound. It hasn't been amplified. As it comes on up into your mouth and into your head, it gets amplified. Well, if you close your mouth, it's just like sticking the, what do you call it, the mute and the horn when you, when you muffle an instrument. You do the very same thing to the sound. There's something trying to get out here. You know, there are some sounds trying to come out. But if I close my mouth or put my hand in front of my mouth, now people on microphone may be getting that, you know, but you do those things, you muffle the sound and you impede that. Okay. Well, what was happening when my mouth was closed, it was making the air go up through my nose. And we call that nasality. Okay. It's a very nasal tone. Most people seem to find it unpleasant. There are certain sounds that have to be made through your nose. M, N, M, N, ing. And if you have a cold and your head's all clogged up, you're going to sound funny because those sounds that are supposed to come through your nose can't do that. And, and so you get the muffled effect. Oh, this is lovely on the air, I know. But if you hold your, oh, maybe I should turn around to do this. But if you hold your nose when you talk, you get a sound that's very similar to the sound that you got when you didn't open your mouth. But it's for a different reason. Only part of the air is getting through. Uh, if your nose is clogged, your head's clogged up, then that's, a, we call it denasal because the air is not going through your nose. And nasal is when there's too much air going through your nose. But that's part of what, uh, it, it definitely affects your ability to amplify the sound and it affects the quality of your voice. It's part of what affects the quality of your voice. Part of the quality you're just born with, 
you know, whether you, you know, whether you're male or female is going to impact it on, in the first part, whether you have thick vocal cords or, or less thick uh, vocal cords. <clears throat> Sometimes we mess up our own voices by screaming, shouting, uh, cheerleaders, school teachers, salespeople, people who use their voice a great deal uh, may create what's called vocal nodules, like little calluses on your vocal cords. <clears throat> and that creates a kind of chronic raspiness or hoarseness. Uh, I haven't heard that from anybody here, but if you, if you discover someone has that kind of problem, they ought to get that checked out. You know, sometimes vocal rest, you know if you've shouted at a ball game until you've lost your voice, that vocal rest is the best thing you can do to get it back. <clears throat> uh, if it's reached the point that you have major irritation, it may take a lot of rest. It may take two or three weeks or a month. Sometimes you even need surgical removal of the nodules. But if there's that kind of problem, it needs to be handled by a professional. Uh, you know, you need professional evaluation of that. And it needs to be handled immediately or as soon as possible. I've known of a couple of instances of people who had nodules or calluses so large that they were inoperable. And if they get large enough, then they're tangled into the vocal cords and you would have to cut the vocal cords to remove the nodule and that's certainly counterproductive because then you'd have no voice at all. You know, you'd have major impairment of your ability to communicate. So part of your vocal quality is a function of what you're born with, but then part of that quality is also determined by how you treat your voice, your ability to relax, whether or not you're tense and tight and here can produce the, the harsh strident effects sometimes. You just want to be aware of that and whatever you can do to uh, generate a, a melodic, pleasant voice as you're working for your conversational style and so forth, those are things that you want to do. The intonation has to do with where you put the emphasis on certain words, uh, which things are important. You know, if we were typing, we'd use bold print or italics or uh, some other effect to say this is more important than the other. Well, we do that vocally by varying the emphasis, by uh, varying the amount of volume, by where we place stress on the syllables or the words themselves. You know, if I can say fragile or I can say fragile, I can say uh, locality or I can say locality and, and still be within realms of, of what people consider uh, normal pronunciation. But, but there are things that we do for emphasis and we need to be aware that we, we have an incredible tool with our voice and that the voice alone won't carry it. You know, if you're standing here like a, a concrete statue or something, you know, if the body language is shot, if you're not in reasonable proximity to your audience, all of those kinds of things, uh, that will detract from it. But your voice is a very powerful tool. And you know from listening to uh, disc jockeys, other personalities, uh, particularly on uh, something like radio where you can't see the body, you, the, the voice is what has to carry it. Uh, you've just got an incredible resource there. And some of you may need to experiment with that and try to see what you can do that will create some variety that will do things differently. Okay, I want to talk a minute about visual aids. No matter what kind of visual aid uh, you're using, you will uh, need to have some basic uh, criteria that you meet, whether you're using slides or overhead projectors or posters or flip charts or real objects or whatever. One of the things you want to do is be sure that your visual aid is appropriate. You know, you, why are you using this visual aid? You don't bring a gerbil in to a wine tasting demonstration. You don't bring a, a model of a building into a food cooking class or 
uh, food prep class or what, you know. Well, why are you using this visual aid? How does it fit what you're presenting at that particular time? Is it relevant and is it appropriate? Now, there's some things that are relevant that aren't appropriate, depending on the age of the group, uh, the propriety considerations of the occasion. You know, is this appropriate for this audience in this uh, particular time and place? Is the visual aid clear? Okay, can the audience understand it? Can they see it? Uh, if they can see it, does it make sense to them? If it's written in a foreign language, that's not going to do any good. Uh, if the lettering is so poor, if the lettering is so small. You know, we had some uh, difficulties the day we were trying to show you the hotel contracts. Okay, and the best we could do was to zoom in on some of the headings in the contract, but there was just no way to put a whole contract up on the screen. And it's not particularly important, it wasn't crucial to what you were doing, but that was not readable. And whether it's tiny type, you know, the visuals that you're getting up on the screens are, are done, oh, I don't know if those are, I think 18, 18 to 24 point font, if that means something to you. They could be a little smaller than that and we could zoom in more. You know, we've got some flexibility with that. But most of the type that you see in your textbooks, for example, are down in the 12 point range. And when you put a whole page of 12 point font up on a screen, whether it's a television screen, whether it's the overhead projector, the audience can't read that, okay, unless they're on the front row. And often that makes a very boring visual to cram that much information up onto an overhead, and so forth. So isolating key ideas, you know, we, we vary the colored backgrounds in here. The color is supposed to be an attention factor and so forth and, and be more appealing than simply looking at all white paper or all cream colored paper or something. Uh, but the audience needs, the, the visual aids need to be appropriate, they need to be relevant, they need to be clear. Uh, they also, part of appropriate in my opinion, uh, you know, they need to be spelled correctly, they need to be accurate. One of my pet peeves is misspell words on visuals. Every once in a while I get one that slips by too. You know, you trust those spell checkers to uh, find things and, and then form instead of from gets through and so forth. And maybe we cut each other a little bit of slack on things like that. But uh, when, when you actually get the wrong word, you know, you get T-H-E-I-R when it should be T-H-E-R-E, -E, uh, that hurts your credibility as a speaker. And you get very many errors in your visuals that hurts your credibility. Checks won't pick up the differentiation it happened to us the other day when we put wherefore premises considered they be denied in their T H E I R packed oh. in T H E R E and the only word that the panel spotted was that there. Mm -hmm. And you can't correct it because the spell there is a proper word. The computer can't tell you in context which word you're right. going to use. The the computer doesn't know if you meant to say what instead of hat or there, or here, or her, or he. You know, there are all kinds of typos you can make that are still spelled correctly. So proofreading still works. And your little tangential proofreading cue is read backwards from the bottom of the page so that you don't get into the flow. So, you know, if you were proofing this, read, read the sentences backwards or go from the bottom. I mean, you can't literally read every letter backwards, but read from the bottom of the page upward, uh, break it up so you, you don't get into your expectation of what's there. Okay, the visuals need to be handled well, whether you're doing a slide presentation or overheads or uh, whatever the case may be, flip charts, you don't, you know, if you've got posters, know before you ever come in. Most posters are more passe than they used to be. But if you have things that need to stand up, you know, where are you going to put them? Do you have something to fasten them to? Do you have clips to hang them? If you have a flip chart, are you bringing it? Is the facility providing it? 
Where do you get these things? How are you going to get the stuff there if it's pouring down rain? Uh, are you going to do them as you talk? If so, you better have wonderful handwriting and it should only be a key outline. Otherwise, you'll be turned around doing this, which is awkward, puts a cramp in your neck, looks bad from the audience's perspective, so forth. I've seen one or two, probably two speakers, use flip charts effectively by having them set up in advance and very lightly penciled. And I didn't know until the presentation was over with. They had very carefully, or someone had for them, penciled in the key words ahead of time. And then they had their marker going along, tracing over those little pencil lines. And that assured that the lettering was straight when it went up. But most of us, if, if we just start writing, are going to end up with a pretty sloppy mess before it's over with. Now, if this is a work session on a brainstorming group and we're just popping stuff out in a hurry, that's one thing. But if this is a formal presentation, uh, that's a different matter. And we want the visual aids to look professional, to look good as well. So how are you going to handle those? How are you going to get them into the meeting? Uh, you want them out of sight until the appropriate time. Generally, you don't want to pass things through the audience. If I start something over here, uh, these guys will be through with it before I ever get to the point. And I may make my point. You know, if I'll say, when you get that photograph, be sure that you look at the object in the upper right-hand corner because that's what we were looking for uh, when we made the trip and, and this was our primary purchase or whatever. <clears throat> well, these folks won't even have seen the photograph or the magazine picture, you know, whatever it is. And the people on this side, it will have passed them by. Whoever has it will probably be looking at that and thinking about it instead of paying attention to what the speaker is saying at that particular time. So generally passing things around is not a good idea. If you've got one for everybody in the audience, uh, that's fine. That's a different matter. Sometimes you can make a presentation and say, uh, at the end of the meeting, there are brochures out on the outside table. If you want additional information, feel free to pick those up. And that's fine. Too. You don't want to give things to people that they're going to throw away and throw all over the floor. Uh, you, just, you need considerations like that. How are you going to handle these things? How are you going to manage them? What are you going to do when your presentation is over? Don't make a big mess that you're going to leave at the lectern or the table or whatever if there's somebody coming behind you. Don't do things that scare your audience half to death. I had a guy shoot off firecrackers one time uh, on state property. We had a little talk about that. Uh, he also had to clean the mess up before he got his grade. Uh, but you know, he scared the audience half to death. Because most of the people, you know, you're sitting in a class and not, not paying that much attention as people are getting set up. And all of a sudden, here's all this horrible noise. And, of course, he was correct when he said, well, now I have your attention. You know, but, but the attention-getting device was not relevant to the speech. I can't even remember now what the speech was on. I just remember the loud noise and the mess that he made. So, you know, you want to be able to handle things well. You want them to be interesting uh, to your audience, appropriate for the occasion, those kinds of things. Now, your delivery will occur in, in one of four basic formats. Uh, some speeches are just impromptu. If I said, come up here and tell me how your project is progressing, how's that going, you know, impromptu, and the light's flashing so it won't happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, some speeches are written out in manuscripts. Some are written out in manuscripts and completely memorized. Generally, there's some problems with that. The kind of presentation I've given you today is extemporaneous, working from a keyword outline. That's usually the most effective, unless you're the president and you're, you know, making a speech that every single word is precise and very technical and so forth. So these are some of the basics of public speaking. Think about those. If you have questions, we'll follow up with them next time. Work on those projects.